So hello again. Uh, tonight's topic is in space. No way is up. Nothing is flat. And we can't see everything. Um, this was something that uh, came to my attention in light of a, a recent uh, James Webb Space Telescope observation of the planet Uranus and the fact that, hey, its rings are tipped on the side because of the way it's rotating. So I said, well, maybe not everybody's connecting the dots and realizing that's how the universe works. So we'll cover that. So I started to start with some simple perspective. Um, until you start thinking about it, your bias of what's up is gravitationally affected. So if you're a person standing on Earth and somebody says, hey, which way is up? You just, you know, you up, it's up. Because you're pointing above your head because you know that your head is at the top of your body. So that must be up. But what about if you're floating around in outer space where there's no land that you're standing on? Um, which way is up? Well, it's still your head, right? That's up. No what way. if there's two of you floating in space and one of you is floating head up and the other one's floating head down? Now which is up? Well, whoever the commander of the mission is, his definition of up obviously is the only definition of up. Not really because... One person can be up that way, another person can be up that way. Well, okay, that's in space, where no one can hear you scream, right? Um, but what about on Earth? Up is always the same, right? Right? Okay, if you're standing in the Arctic, which way is up? Well, it's obviously which way of your head's pointing. Okay, what if you're down in Antarctica? Uh, which way is up? Well, that would be south. Because that's where your head's pointing. But, you know, the Earth is tilted on its axis. So even if you think north is up, it's not up. It's all your perspective of which way is up based upon gravity, the planet that you're on, whether it's tilted or not. So up is not really something you should use as a reference when you're describing where you saw something. Now, you could say, from my location, I saw it at azimuth so many degrees and elevation or altitude so many degrees, and that's where I saw it in the sky. That works because you give a frame of reference and then you give a relative offset to that frame of reference. So when somebody says, where did you see that? Oh, it's up in the sky. Okay, when was it and where were you? And now I know where in the sky it is. So everything's from your perspective. And then for those people that think it's flat, right? Well, you know, if you go out to the Midwest and you look around over a large open section of land, it all looks pretty much flat. And that's true. But you have to realize that gravity has an effect on things as they become larger and larger. And there's a hydrostatic equilibrium that will crush things into a roughly spheroidal shape maybe initially as like potato shaped, but eventually as it gets larger, more and more sphere shaped. So what you think of as flat land on earth is merely a small field of view reference to something that's a larger spheroidal shape. So I'm, I'm not you know, saying that people that think the earth is flat have got it wrong. I'm, I'm guessing they you know, realize that there are mountains on the earth. So, the Earth isn't really flat, even if they think it's flat. But uh, if you've ever watched videos of things on the moon or space probes in space, when they point back at Earth and they take a 24-hour view, you can see that the Earth rotates on its axis. But don't get me started on those astrophysicists or cosmologists that refer to the universe as being flat. What they're actually referring to is the universe is uniform in density over extremely large distances. It's not actually vertically flat. Uh, the universe obviously has a height dimension. And uh, if you doubt that, then obviously the things in the sky above your head were just painted there to confuse you. So here's where you have to lose the uh, conceit. And people do get this if they don't focus well enough on things around them. Um, not everything is pointed at you. Think about the sun, for example. We are on Earth. Earth is orbiting in the plane of the solar system. 
It's orbiting around the sun. Have you ever seen the north or south pole of the sun? Well, you're in the plane of the solar system. The sun's not all that tilted to the plane of the solar system. So, no, you cannot directly view the north or south pole of the sun. What about the north or south pole of Jupiter? Well, Jupiter's pretty close to the, uh, aligned with the plane of the solar system. So, no, we've not seen direct visual evidence of the north or south pole of Jupiter. However, I've included two pictures here. The bright one that has a little you know, yellow and white in it. That is the North Pole of the Sun. But we had to have a space probe go on a very long elliptical orbit that slowly tilted and eventually it got to go over the top of the Sun. It didn't go underneath the bottom of the Sun because it was kind of a, a wobbled orbit. So it was closer to the North Pole than the South Pole. So it took a picture of for the first time ever. Yeah, the camera had crosshairs on it. The crosshairs intersect at the north pole of rotation of the sun. And the one that's turquoise, just to the lower right of it, that is one of the poles of Jupiter. It's the south pole of Jupiter, in case you were confused. Um, but the poles of rotation of a planet always look a little different than the equator because things are moving in a circular direction as opposed to a lateral direction. So that's why they look a bit unusual. And if you could see them in motion, it would be obvious that the planet's rotating underneath it or the sun is rotating underneath it. But uh, the blue uh, streak with the purple dot underneath it, imagine that's a pulsar and the pulsar is a rotating neutron star and it's spewing radiation, mostly in radio bands, but uh, sometimes in x-ray. And it's sweeping across the sky on a very regular basis. But those are very narrow fields of energy. And they do spread out, but not all that much over even light years. So if you have a neutron star that's rapidly spinning and spewing out its uh, radiation, if that radiation doesn't intersect with planet Earth, we can't see it. It just looks like a uh, neutron star that's gone radio quiet. How do you know it's radio quiet? Well, it's not saying anything to us, so it must be quiet, right? So there could be pulsars and quasars out there that are producing emissions, but since they're not aimed towards us, we're not in the field of view of the beam, we think of them as quiet when they may not actually be quiet. Here's a uh, common uh, image taken by amateur astronomers, the Sombrero Galaxy. It's called a Sombrero because, well, if you think of a Sombrero hat and you tilt it to the point where you can see the brim of the hat, um, it looks far different than a uh, galaxy where the center of the galaxy is pointed towards us. But most people see that left picture as the Sombrero Galaxy. What you don't realize is the Sombrero Galaxy is also quite tilted on its axis towards us. So not only do we see it almost edge on, but it's tilted. But most of the time when you see a picture of the Sombrero, they want to highlight the fact that it's almost edge on, but they don't want to also confuse things, so they will artificially level the picture so that you don't see it tilted and tilted at the same time. But imagine if it was more tilted towards us. All you would see is a, uh, an elliptical glowing area with a black line across the center. And if you've ever seen Saturn, when its rings are tilted pretty much onto the Earth, it looks like a hamburger bun because you can see the top and bottom of the planet, and then you just see a black line going through the center. So not everything is pointed at us. And here's some examples of those things. Um, it says out point of view. It should say our point of view. Sorry about that. Our point of view disallows seeing some things. So in the upper right, we see Uranus. And we can see a lovely complete set of rings because it's an infrared. It'll pick up dimmer, lower energy things than our, cam our typical visible camera image would. And think about it for a moment. Not only 
is the planet rotating where its pole is pretty much 90 degrees to the plane of the solar system. But also, where is the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, it's out at Lagrange point two. So it's which direction? Well, it, it stays at L2 as the Earth orbits the sun. So could we see Uranus six months from now from the James Webb Space Telescope? No, because it would be over towards the other side and the Webb Telescope can't look back towards Earth because it would be blinded by the light. So this was an opportunistic photograph. Not only is Uranus flipped on its side, but it's also flipped towards the James Webb Space Telescope in its L2 orbit around the sun with the Earth. So it's not only your point of view, but your point of view when. So the picture at the lower left is the best, most complete um, Einstein ring uh, that the James Webb Space Telescope has ever taken. And that particular uh, galaxy or a very blue star is oriented towards us where the, the gravitational field is pretty much circular around it. Although you can see some bright spots. So those are more likely caused by the thing in the background that's behind it. It's very bright, but it's not directly in line with that uh, bright blue area. It's more like a little above or a little below. So you, you may actually see multiple occurrences of it. Monroe, can yes. I explain what it actually is? So if you get a, a, a glass of wine and you have the, the bottom of the your glass, and when you put like a dot or something under your table and you move and the image of that dot goes around uh, as a, a ring, so basic that. So a heavy object is right in the center and you can see a galaxy that's being stretched out twice or three times, uh, and then it's going around the circle. So this is a perfect Einstein ring. It means that you can see the center of the galaxy, like on the top, like around one and two o'clock, you see the center twice. And then when you look at um, four o'clock and uh, six, seven o'clock you can see again the same image so this is one galaxy that the image is being stretched out in space time because that is one object that it is in the center so that galaxy that you see around as a ring is actually behind the, that star or that galaxy yeah and the gravitational mass the blue thing in the center is aligned with us so that we can see the ring because if it was tilted down, you wouldn't get to see the Einstein ring is perfectly circular. And things, they are changing in space. Everything's moving, orbiting, rotating. So uh, I've actually watched Saturn go through this over a 20 year period where when uh, Saturn is tilted far enough. Now, now Saturn stays at a particular tilt in its orbit, but it goes around the sun at that tilt and therefore, as the Earth orbits the sun, our perspective on that tilt changes. So we get to see what looks like the rings of Saturn tilting for our benefit, but it's not. It's just our point of view looking out towards Saturn. So in the upper right, you'll see when the rings are best, you can actually see the shadow of the rings. Uh, you can actually see the shadow of the planet on the rings. But as it gets more towards us, the shadow starts to disappear and the rings become thinner and thinner and thinner. And eventually you get the hamburger bun syndrome where you see the top of Saturn, you see the bottom of Saturn, and you just see a thin black line between the two. And that's Saturn's orientation of its polar rotation towards us. And then you've got Uranus where it's almost 90 degrees to the plane of the solar system. So you get to see all of the ring system, not just a slice of it. But what about when things are too bright? So we've talked about things we can't see because of our perspective, our view of it. But what about when things are too bright and you can't see things nearby or behind them? Well, um, that does happen. So the uh, the James Webb Space Telescope 
would like to take a picture of the exoplanets orbiting the star Hipparchos 65426. But the star is really, really bright. So what they do is they have, um, you can either use a disk or you can use shutters in the imager to block out the bright starlight. And now you can take pictures of things that are far dimmer than the star. And if you have an infrared imager, you can take it in different wavelengths. So you see the little white star in the individual uh, images down at the bottom. You see the star, a star, a star, a star. That's where the star actually is located, but they've blotted out the bright light from the star so that you can see the exoplanet. And they've looked at it in different wavelengths. This is all of the same exoplanet orbiting Hipparchos 65426. This is the B planet. But what if the star has a planet orbiting it, and it's a very elongated orbit, and the orbit is on the far side of that star? Um, we're probably not going to be able to see that exoplanet because it might not be at the correct angle to come out from the side or the top or the bottom of the star for many years. So if you have a, a planet that's an exoplanet and it's at the orbital distance of something like Pluto is from our sun and we're looking towards that star, if we blot out the star and that planet's going behind the star at a very far distance, it may not be bright enough and it may not come out from behind that star for many years to come. So we could look at a star and go, let's find the exoplanets. And we don't see any wobble because it's so far away and moving so slowly. And the wobble would be towards and away from us, which is harder to measure. But it's way back there. And if we blot out the star, we don't see any exoplanet. So we could actually, in our lookings for exoplanets, found systems where we don't see any exoplanets of any kind. We don't even detect the wobble of them, but the planets are still there. We just can't discern that they're there or measure a wobble in the star or measure a spectral shift in the star because they're in such long orbits so far away. So we're getting into the, it's there, but you can't see it. So here's another one. Some things are too dim. If the brightness of something falls below the threshold at which the photons would produce electrons that then you can count, it may be that it's not the particular wavelength or frequency of the photons. It may be that there are just so few of them that you're not collecting enough energy in your detector to say, I saw something. So what we use is photomultipliers. These are either tubes or solid state semiconductor circuits that literally add voltage as a side to bump the signal you're seeing. So it, it's essentially like using a magnifying glass at the electron level. Uh, you have electrons flowing in, you add more electrons to it to boost the signal. So you take it from um, picoamperes. People have heard of amps, they have amps in their house. Well, let's see, a nanoampere would be one one thousand, uh, one one billionth of a of a ampere. Take it to the next level. A pico ampere is one one thousandth of a nano ampere. That's at the level we're able to detect things nowadays is pico amperes. But what if it's even dimmer than that? We wouldn't detect it at all. But what if it's just a couple of pico amperes and we jack up the signal with a multiplier? Uh, the multipliers add noise. And noise can come from a number of different sources, most of which is electronic infrared heat due to the circuitry of whatever you're using to pass the signal. Well, you can super cool that stuff, critically cool it in like liquid nitrogen or liquid helium, and that'll get rid of some of it, but some will remain. And if you amplify it too much, your signal can get embedded in your noise and therefore, you can't claim that you've received signal. You've just received a lot of noise, and you can't pick the signal from the noise somewhere where you know your signal-to-noise ratio is so low, you can't claim you've actually detected something. So sometimes things can be too dim, too far away, can't pick up enough energy. And that's 
flux. That, that's not to do with the wavelength or frequency. Now we get into wavelength and frequency. When we create sensors, we use the chemistry of the material to receive photons and to produce electrons from that as a means of the photoelectric effect. So we'll take in the photons at a particular wavelength based upon the chemistry of the material we're using for our detector. If the chemistry of that material is not lined up properly with the wavelength of the photons, even though the photons are there, it will not be in the bandwidth of the detector and therefore it will not detect it. Think of it like a radio tuner. Um, if I tune to a certain band, I can only hear the radio station that's there. If I were to open up my band spread and hear a much wider band spread, I would get lots of noise from all the other radio stations broadcasting at different frequencies. So what I do is I create my detector to look for, you know, specifically infrared or ultraviolet or X-ray or gamma. I create the detector with chemistry specifically so I can see in that range. Well, there are bands and notches. So I can't create a universal detector that can detect anything. I create a detector that can detect a certain band spread. And I can create another detector that create that it's sensitive to a different band spread. What about the gap between the two band spreads? I hear nothing. I know nothing. Um, so you can be sensitive to a particular wavelength or frequency and have more than enough flux, but it'd be just outside your sensitivity range and you're not going to detect it. There are things called harmonics that you might be able to detect if you're at the correct wavelength distance from the central peak, but that will be at a lower amplitude. So you got to have the right flux, the right wavelength, which is the right energy. And then again, it could be pulsing too fast. Too slow, we got no problem. That leaves streaks. But what if things are too fast, a cycle? There's these two guys named uh, Nyquist and Shannon. You can look them up. That um, They basically say, if the frequency of occurrence, not the wavelength of the photon, but the actual pulse width of the occurrence, is such that it's happening twice as fast or faster than your sampling, you might not ever see it. And that's why we make our analog to digital converters, our ADCs, sample at faster and faster rates. But if you sample way fast, you'll find that the number of bits per sample also gets reduced. So for example, audio, computer audio, it started out at 22,000 samples per second with uh, an 8-bit sample. Then they got to 16-bit samples. And then they found out if I sample really fast, like 96,000 samples per second, I can pick up all that I need to. Plus, I can actually watch the shape of the waveform because I'm monitoring it going up and down. So I don't really need a lot of bits. If I just have one bit that monitors it up and down as the sample changes, um, I don't need like a 24-bit sampler. I can have a one-bit sampler. And it actually has a bit sample behind a bit sample stack. So that's how we do it with audio. When it comes to visual, we've got uh, you know the, the wavelength based upon the material that's the sensor. In the case of radio, we have samples per second. So how many samples per second I'm taking can limit the actual uh, frequency of what I'm picking up because it's happening too fast for my receiver. Uh, people know this um, in, in the world of like videos on the internet where somebody says, watch me shoot this bullet. And you shoot it and all you hear is noise and then an explosion at the distance, maybe a flash at the gun. You don't actually get to see the bullet travel across the sky. But if you have a high-speed camera and it's capturing lots of frames per second, it can see the bullet moving across the sky. So the same sort of thing in other technologies. If you want to pick up a signal that's at a very high frequency, you better be sampling at a very high rate. And this is one of the things that um, they're improving 
the gravitational wave detectors. They want to be able to collect very much higher frequency gravity waves because right now they're, they're kind of lethargic. You know, it's, it's lower frequency gravity waves. Uh, kind of like it's easy for a human being to hear hum. It's a lot more difficult for you to hear an ultrasonic transducer because it's happening so fast, your ability to hear it is limited because your brain doesn't sample that fast. So here's the consequences of all that stuff. So if there's no photons headed our way, we can't have the photons convert to electrons to allow us to detect something. So we can't see it. Probably why uh, black holes are black, not because their color is black, but because we're not getting any photons from them, or we're getting a flux that's so low that we can't detect them. Or maybe instead of looking in the electromagnetic radiation, we should be looking in gravity waves. Although we still rely upon um, you know, photons creating electrons, and that's how we measure even gravity waves. But that's due to a uh, uh, interferometer effect. And they're actually working to improve that. But we'll also not be able to detect photons if they're going in a direction other than towards our sensor. And if the energy level is too low <clears throat> and we can't amplify it enough without getting into noise, we won't see it again. And if our sample rate's not good enough, we won't see it again. If there are too many dist distracting photons, there's a bright thing in the way, still won't be able to see it. And if it's hiding out behind it, still won't be able to see it. So you start to get the picture that if distributions of energy are spheroidal, and they're uniform. There's a lot of stuff out there that we cannot detect. We can't observe it. So when we declare something as dark, like dark matter, um, is it something that's unseen? Or is it something that we just, with our current technology, we'll never be able to see because it's behind something, it's not pointed at us, it's too low a level, it's there but we just can't see it, can't observe it, can't detect it. But we know for sure it can't possibly be that. Well, how do we know that? Well, um, if you grew up learning astronomy, you realize that we went from a few million stars in our galaxy to a few hundred million to a million. So now we're talking about our galaxy having over 100 billion stars in it. Well, same thing's true of galaxies. In the 19, early 1920s, we thought Milky Way was the only galaxy in the universe. And then as we improved our uh, astronomy and telescopes, we realized, hey, there's this thing we call Andromeda Nebula that looks a lot like a galaxy. So maybe there's a lot of galaxies. And as our technology improved, we now have millions to billions of galaxies. So as the technology improves, as we have more nearly continuous observing, and we observe from the ground at altitude and in space, we start to see more stuff. It's not because this is brand new stars or brand new galaxies. They've been there all along. We just couldn't see them. And in the case of exoplanets, the phrase blinded by the light comes into play because until we invented the coronagraph to blot out the central star, we couldn't image exoplanets. But now we can. So um, if you realize that there are now things that we might never see, can't easily see, or can only see sometimes, how do we claim to know how much stuff is out there? Well, it's extrapolation. If there's this much on this side and things are spherical and uniform in their distribution, then maybe there's roughly the same amount on the other side. They often say this about when we peer out through the Milky Way galaxy, even in infrared, we can see more of what's on the other side, but we can't see all of what's on the other side. Because by the time you get to the distant edge of the Milky Way galaxy, the brightness of those stars is so far away that may not be able to detect it. And the stars in the foreground may actually be obscuring stars further in the background. So we're just making the assumption based upon what we see on this side, and what we can see on that side, it looks like it's uniform from this side to that side, 
So why don't we just double it? Well, uh, that's a good guess, but it's a guess. And when people say, we know how much matter there is in the universe and we're missing some matter, so we have to have dark matter. Maybe it's not that it's not emitting. Maybe it's just, you know, you have to think in a non-conceited fashion and go, maybe it is emitting a lot and it's just not pointed at us. Or maybe it's hiding behind the uh, the uh, central black hole of the galaxy and we can't see it. So there could be enormous stars on the far side of the black hole at distance towards the far rim of the galaxy. and. We don't know they're there, so we can't measure their mass. So what we think of as dark is just we can't detect it. But if we realize that that's our perspective, our point of view in space, and that our sensor technology is limited, um, maybe what we're calling dark might simply be never observable or not observable from our perspective or not observable based upon our current technology. And remember that infrared and ultraviolet existed long before we discovered them. We didn't invent them. We discovered them. We invented the technology. And the moon has no permanently dark side. Thanks to those musical guys there on the upper right. By the way, that's not actually their cover photo. What's the first thing that's wrong with that cover photo? It's facing the wrong direction should be the rainbow on the right. So in conclusion, we can't see, observe, or detect everything, particularly if the photons required to detect things are not headed in that direction, or they're redirected by a gravitational field, or they're obscured by a bright object or a black hole or whatever. Um, you know, when somebody makes a pronouncement of, we know how much matter there is in the universe and we're missing some. Well, you just said you're missing some, so you don't know how much there is. So whenever you make a postulation or a, a extrapolation or a conjecture, just let people know. It, it doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing or you're bad at it. It just means there's a percentage in your estimate that says we could be off by this much. Particularly when we know that there are other mediums besides the electromagnetic spectrum like gravitational waves and that uh, we know we're not doing a great job in, in gravity wave detection when it comes to a uh, high frequency at a very low amplitude. So they are making improvements to uh, LIGO, uh, should be online by sometime next year, where they will be able to detect higher frequency, lower amplitude gravity waves. Uh, you know, it could be that there are other things out there that are human physiology and science and technology don't allow us to observe it. Kind of like when we discovered infrared and ultraviolet, and they were always emitting, but we just lacked the science and technology to see them. So two quotes, which I didn't attribute to anyone, but the first one is, I think, mine. You'll never realize how much you didn't know until you know what you didn't know. Always a circular one, nice one. And, uh, from the original Men in Black movie, imagine what you'll know tomorrow. And I threw in, assuming you try. And for those people that aren't familiar with them, I threw in a little something about the photoelectric effect, that Einstein guy again, uh, and then the Nyquist Shannon. When I was growing up, it was just the Nyquist theorem. And they went back and went, Hey, 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 Shannon needs to get a little vote in that too. So it became the Nyquist-Shannon theorem. And the advanced LIGO detector, there's a Wikipedia article on that so people can learn more about how much LIGO is improving and the fact that they're going from um, a Michelson interferometer design to a quantum detection design. So not only are they improving the technology to be higher frequency sensitive and have a higher sample rate, they're also improving the lowest possible signal they can detect. To quote a uh, Vulcan, fascinating. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so is there anything that 
people didn't originally know existed that have become things that do exist based upon things improving over time us becoming more observant over time a particular uh space probe or something or a radio telescope or uh all kinds of stuff well no nobody knew about germs germs were not visible you have to look into the history of the microscope lavoisier used to bring his loop microscope to social parties and he put a drop of pond water in the uh loop microscope and let the you know the general public that was at his social events look at all the stuff in the water and it would just freak the hell out of people yeah. i'm drinking that yes you are there was a uh uh, epidemiologists in Brazil during the time that you have the chicken pox uh, uh, dying out of everyone mm -hmm. and he was trying to educate people to isolate the disease to come into the state and so uh, what he did he went to like communities and explained that the the it's uh, the vi the virus the bug that kills you that gives you chicken pox it's small than the uh, than the flea that affects the chicken because that yeah. you can see it's very tiny you know and then it's a it's smaller than that and that's what gives you the disease so imagine like without the microscope people didn't even know there was so much life that it was smaller than that well, and yeah that's a cool one the human species has always had a characteristic that if i can't see it if it's not talking to me then it doesn't exist and it's only with the advancements in science and technology that we realize uh as they refer to it the unseen world and one aspect of the unseen world is microscopic and when you start seeing what scanning tunneling electron microscopes can see um they're down to uh small numbers of nanometers but that's not the smallest things in the universe there is a thing called the planck length that gets down many many thousands of times smaller than the smallest thing we can currently see um you know we, we're talking about not just nanometers or picometers but atometers so a billionth of a billionth of a meter mm. and the other that's thing where physics that's runs normally out. invisible to us that it's something that it's apply is when you start to doing spectro uh, spe spectroscopy spectrophotometric uh measurements this was started to you know just a curiosity that you put in a flame some salts and see the lines and then you start to understand that you can figure out what atom is that just because of the those lines and with that science that started in a laboratory as chemistry and became the basis of astronomy to how do you know the composition of things in space so far away and also medicine because you use those uh uh, uh, uh spectrum spectrometers as you know you get a, a a prick on your finger you put a little drop of blood and you put inside the machine that's nothing more or less than a spectroscopy because uh, you know it is actually measuring the light that's going through that little mm. tab that you put inside and that light will see the lines of the elements they're blocking or emitting depending on what kind of energy you're using and you can know the composition of your cholesterol your sugar you can know the composition of a bunch of things that you look on your blood and your plasma and also you can look at, at the composition of stuff that's so far away in space so you, you can see the chemistry the temperatures how far they are how fast they are moving away or toward us just because you use a simple science that you know started a, a long long ago with you know people putting salts and flame and seeing the lines that form and it's especially you know the same kind of science that you see the colors 
in in, in fireworks. It's it's the same science, you know. It's chemistry that's going to the small or in the laboratories in hospital or to the large in composition of galaxies and stuff far away. So it's really cool. But it's one thing to think of it as, as astronomy, it's astrophysics, it's things far away. But the one that will affect you directly is a technology called Massimo. That's the name of the company. Rainbow technology. When you go by an SpO2 meter, a uh, blood oxygenation meter, and you stick it on your finger, what it's actually doing is it's shining different colors of light through your finger, through the tissue of your finger, and it's got a little tiny camera that senses a color picture of that small area. And then it does a wavelength analysis of the colors in the image to see what the peaks and valleys are, kind of like a poor man's spectrograph. And from that, it can detect is your blood properly oxygenated by the amount of iron hemoglobin they can see in the colors of the image coming out of it. So, a few years ago, those were shown to be not as accurate for people with darker skin. Yes. Has that been corrected? Um, the correction that they did was they changed the wavelength from a single infrared wavelength to green. And by using green, the light will be uh, more transparent to pretty much anybody's skin. But the and then it works on Vulcans too. Yeah. Well, the problem that they still have is people with thick skin. There are people that work in um, certain milling environments where they have a lot of calluses on their fingertips, and those are more difficult to read through because not as much light passes through the amplitude is too low for the detector but yeah they went from infrared only to multi-spectral and that i think corrected the issue with different oh. colors of skin good rainbow technology is uh computer assisted spectroscopic analysis of the light passing through your tissue in order to do blood chemistry analysis on the fly and what they've recently learned is if you change the sampling rate to be very much faster, you can actually see the blood vessels in the finger expanding and contracting with the heart rate. So that's how come they added not just blood chemistry, but blood pressure and heart rate to the SpO2 meters. They just had to increase the amplitude and the sample rate. And now they can detect additional things. They're still working on the tricorder, though. I'm guessing they'll have it soon. There are already... I, I, I heard that. It's it's coming. It's you know, coming. There, there are already technologies that you can buy that would be equivalent to a bio bed, where you just lay down on this bed, and there's a special pad under the mattress, and it actually sends pulses of energy into your body don't affect your body any it's kind of like an mri thing it sends the pulses in and based upon the emissions and the reflectivity it can determine your heart rate your respiration and your blood pressure by just so, laying on the bed. Uh, no waking you up with the little bagging exactly planning. and yeah. even better the company that wants to own that technology that um they want to be able to have bio beds. So this would be an intelligent bed that's connected to the hospital network that you would no longer have to wake the patient up to take vital signs measurements. And you would no longer have to get the patient to move around in order to do body mass measurements, which people that have been through burns, um, people that are obese, people that have been through uh, you know cancer removal surgery, their body mass, their weight, is very significant to the, the level of health they have. So having almost continuous measurements of their vitals and their body mass and their weight is very meaningful to improving the quality of health in these patients. So uh, yeah, things are advancing. They're advancing because large companies want to dominate marketplaces. And the best way to do that is to have technology that no one else can have. It's not that they hide the patent in a drawer and never bring it to market. It's that 
They get the lawyers ready. They bring the technology to market and an updated product that everybody's got to buy. And it's new and expensive because it's got the new stuff in it. But it removes things like bothering the patients, which improve the, cu the yeah. customer satisfaction scores. If you've ever worked in a hospital, you'll know there's this thing called press gainy scores. And press yeah. gainy scores are money in the bank when it comes to a hospital. It's patient satisfaction in surveys. So if you don't have to wake the patient up to take the vitals, if you don't have to get the patient to move around to measure their weight every morning, if, if you can also detect when the patient's moving around in the bed when they're not supposed to, hey, I thought they were comatose. They must be awake now. Or they're supposedly bedridden, but rather than being embarrassed and using the bedpan, they're about to try and get up out of the bed and fall, and you have a fall injury. So, yeah, all these advancements in technology are really helping to make healthcare better if the hospitals can afford the technology. So as long as it's owned by a large corporation charging a lot of money for the advancement, kind of difficult for all of us to get benefit from it. Uh, Monroe? Yes. Um, I was in the hospital last week for a hernia operation. Yeah. And, and I can assure you, uh, uh, even beyond patient satisfaction, if somebody has a bed where a nurse doesn't need to come in and take your blood pressure or your temperature or, or your vitals, uh, if they can keep a nurse from having to go in there, um, the big money is not high, is hiring less personnel. Yes, the big money is how many more patients can one nurse serve per shift? But I even tried working on that in, uh, when I was working with Philips, actually emerging beforehand. Um, I saw the promise of digital picture frames. And I said, if I can write software that will send updated JPEGs to a digital picture frame, then I can take data from who is the nurse currently on shift for what patient, synthesize a JPEG of the text of that information and send that to the picture frame so that when the nurse comes on duty at the start of their shift, they just log in and say, I'm here, I'm ready to serve my patients. And I can automatically, as the pickup of their, their you know, login, manufacture that up for the patients they've been assigned to serve and then send that to a digital picture frame on those patients' rooms so that the display would automatically update and say, your nurse for this shift is Judy. You're, uh, uh, you know, you're assigned, uh, hospital assigned physician is Dr. Brown. Um, I could put that information out there and I could have the current time and date in big letters and numbers. And I think the patients would love it. And I had a hospital administrator say, do not bring that to my hospital. I said, why not? Because it removes one more reason why the on-staff physician or the on-assignment nurse does not look in on the patient to see what's going on. How are you doing? What's your pain level? All that kind of stuff. Another technology company came out and said, we've got a solution for that. What if we'll put a, a, a little robot camera that will drive around from room to room and have the smiling face of the doctor on the display and a microphone and a camera pointing at the patient. And the robot can walk up to the patient and say, hi, I'm Dr. Brown. How are you doing today? Some hospital test complexes signed up for that and went, get that the thing, my patients. It's scaring the crap out of them. <laughs> so uh, there are advances that's in technology. Creepy. There are advances in technology. Well, some people just refer to it as that thing's creepy. <laughs> you know, having the face of the doctor walking around. And some of the technology companies actually made the display head shape, almost as if it was projecting the face of the doctor on this floating head. And like, oh, well, no, get that it's thing to hell. Worse. It's <laughs> even worse. But well, where it did help was on the back office stuff. So You've got dumb waiters and pneumatic tube delivery systems and robotic delivery systems that are working in hospitals to take labor off the staff, to take reliability of delivery 
off the staff, off like when you when a doctor puts in his prescription for a particular uh, pharmaceutical that the patient needs right now, um, you can have somebody hot foot it over to the pharmacy, pick up the immediate order and bring it right back and you know jab it into the input to the uh, the infusion pump. That's great, and you may actually have those critical meds on stock in the care unit. But what monitors when you run low on that and gets another order from the pharmacy? They now have cabinets that when you open the drawer, the particular drawer is for a particular med. And when you open the drawer and you put by weight a certain number of vials of that med and you close the drawer, it knows what the inventory is. And then when you open the drawer, you take one out, you put the drawer back, it knows when you're getting low. It can automatically issue a new restock order, not a patient admit order, but a restock order for the care unit to get more from the pharmacy, and it can be delivered by robot. There are advancements going on. Technology is not sitting still. There's always a new company coming along that goes, if I just had this, it would be better than sliced bread, and I'll corner the market and have a monopoly, and I'll make b -b -b billions in my eyeballs. And you know, if it really does work out that well, some even bigger fish, most likely a shark, is going to gobble it up before it ever sees the light of day or before it ever gets to be a multi-billion dollar company. Yes, things they are improving. Don't worry about that aspect of it. Just worry about whether or not your local hospital can afford to deploy it. Not just hospitals, but restaurants. When the waitress oh. takes the water, they order <laughs> more potatoes or whatever. Yeah. How about this one? Panera Bread. Panera Bread restaurants? How do they know to come to your table? Oh, well, that's easy. Well, they give you something, and you take it to your table, and you sit it on the table. Yeah. How do they know where it is? That's because your table has an RFID tag in the table, and when you plop the little thing down on the table, it sends the RFID code of your table back to the people in the back part of the restaurant. And when your order completes, they know exactly which table to bring it to. And then I started having wiseacre comments with the restaurant staff going, so at night, when you shove all the tables over into the corner, and then you clean the floor, and then you put the tables back out on the floor, do you have to make sure that all the right tables go in the right locations? Yes. So each table has a little identifier code on it, and they can monitor where the tables are and put the tables back where they need to be. And those codes are actually readable. If you have a smartphone that has an NFC reader in it, you can turn on the NFC reader, hover the app around the top surface of the table, and actually get the code number of the table. So technology is it advancing. And this doesn't require those fancy beeper modules to know where you're at. How does it do that? Anytime technology can reduce costs, reduce steps, reduce deployment efforts, make it automagical, they do it. Because there's money in them dar heels. You know, I saw this week uh, uh, on the news that if you park a really fancy, expensive car, uh, outside of your house that someone can come with a big antenna and stand outside your window or door and uh, sense the fob code and drive away with your car. Yes, and it doesn't even have to be an electric car. Yes, they said that too. I don't know why that what I don't know why that's significant, but boy, I well thank goodness. I uh, my car is a 2005 uh, Corolla. Well, my car is a 2010 Ford Expedition. And the driver's side automatic door lock is broken. So I have to use the key, a physical key. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, you can take your average Raspberry Pi computer, put a little wire antenna on a pin, sample the pin at a certain rate, which I think is 428 megahertz. You double that. So around, uh, you know, a million samples, uh, sorry, a billion samples a second, gigahertz, and um, you can sample it and collect the signal. If you see somebody push the button on their remote, 
or walk up to their car and use NFC, you can sample the radio signal, record it, and the next time they park their car in there and go inside the house, you just replay the digital transmission and you transmit the radio signal. The car doesn't know any better. It goes, you want me to unlock? I can unlock. And these smarter cars nowadays that don't even have to be electric, they can even start for you. Mm -hmm. I thought I would never have the hope of owning a Corvette or a Lamborghini or something, you yeah. know. You've given well, me that, hope. That's, that's why you have to have it low jacked. So you can use radio frequency to help you as opposed to hurt you. I, I have an RFI uh, uh, a fob holder. Yep. And I can drop my uh, um, clicker in that every night. So if somebody drives by my house, they can't, you know, get the signal and then open the car. Uh, same thing. I have an RFI wallet. Uh, yeah, yeah, but your clicker, your clicker is not transmitting until you push the button. Uh, when they're no, going to drive, no, when they're going to drive I, by and I, record it. When I walk near my car, it knows me. It lights up like a puppy. Yeah, it does. That's because it, it has, has an NFC reader in it, and it detects the presence of an NFC field in your car. Well, it, uh, uh, and I, I can also put my credit card in there. So if I go in the store, yes, I can go in with uh, the the key fob with the key yep. and the uh, credit card. So somebody walking by you in a store doesn't pick up your credit card information. Yep. But the problem they were having was people with a push button fob on even a non-electric car walk up to the car, they push the button to open the door and they don't see somebody hiding, you know, in the bushes away from them recording the RF signature of their push button. And they come back from whatever trip they're on. They lock their car. They go inside the house. And then the guy in the bushes just replays the RF signal. The car unlocks. They, you know, jumpstart the car and it's gone. Yeah. There's also uh, programs that you can, especially like Hondas and stuff, uh, start your car and unlock the car uh, using a cell phone. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, they started this years ago with just a push button. Um, in colder climates, because it's much better if, um, you know, you get your car started before you go out to it, because then the heater's going to be on. Oh, good idea, yeah. Yeah, but that's where it came from. It didn't come from, like, electric cars or anything. Um, that technology was has been around for decades. Um, but, yeah, the, uh, you know, the, there's always a way of using whatever energy signature you're reliant upon, recording that and playing it back. Um, the uh, the same article that I read actually mentioned the LoJack solution, and they said it's it's becoming less and less useful. But now they just uh, put a screen around the whole chop shop, and you they drive it into a Faraday cage. Yes, um, oh, wow. they, they they did that years ago. Um, that's why my last car, which was a Navigator, had a LoJack in it. But when I found out copper wire guys, no more signal, because LoJack explained. We're not going to tell you where our LoJack transmitter is in your car. So you can't find it. And there's no common place to look for it. And it's very small. And the battery lasts for three years. And then you pay us, bring your car into the shop, and we'll replace the battery. Mm -hmm. it, no, sounds too much like work money maker for you every so often. So I didn't get it in the newer car. You could well, I look at it the other way and say, five. well, what if the car is transmitting something that you find acceptable and then you transmit back to the car a unique instant, unique per instance value. And, you know, in a login, this is something called uh, CHAP, Challenge Access Protocol, where you have an algorithm and, you know, you know who you're talking to, who's talking to you knows you, and therefore you can exchange a challenge. And it's not like who's your grandmother or whatever. Um, it's an electronic signature. And that way you have secured communication. But, you know, I, I don't want to put that in a little clicker because that means every car's clicker is now going to cost more money. Mm -hmm. Hey, technology is helpful if you know how to use it and use it properly. True. A police officer came into a meeting we had for a city of Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Hills, mm -hmm. and he said the same thing about that key fob 
how they can how they can pick up the signal. And yep. he said, "Don't leave your keys by the front door. Put them in a container away from the door." Well, and when, if 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 your key fob happens to be uh, NFC based, you don't have to actually push a button. You just get close to the reader. So yeah, that one's already always transmitting, but it only transmits in the presence of a strong RF field. So yeah, if you shield it, it's not going to receive the strong RF field, so it's not going to send. But if it's a push button fob, the only time it's transmitting is when you push the button. You could put them in a metal box, a little tin box or something. Yeah, but how many other things are like that? How about your mobile phone? Uh -huh. Your mobile phone is not only an NFC transmitter, it's an NFC receiver. So you can pick up other people's phones. Or, hey, I just go to the gas station and I just, you know, lay my credit card on the pump and it reads it. Yeah, and the guy over in the bushes can read it too because oh, your credit card nowadays has a little, like, looks like speaker symbol on it. That means it's NFC attached. And if it receives a signal, it starts up and sends a signal to the gas pump or the grocery store checkout. So I use my card, but I insert the card into the chip reader. Monroe? Yes. Uh, you want to turn off the recording? I want to return off the recording. Okay. Give me a second. <laughs>